Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of the Wintrust Wealth Management Panel Discussion Series on the Economy and Financial Markets. Today, we'll talk about really four things. We'll talk about interest rates. We'll touch on the local and the U.S. economy. We'll talk about the banking market. And then finally, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the markets. Uh, with me today, I'm pleased to have, uh, as always, Jason Turner, who's our Chief Investment Strategist, as well as our Head of Multi-Asset Strategies at Wintrust Wealth Management. Welcome, Jason. Thank you, Tom. And today we have a special guest, our President and Chief Executive Officer at Wintrust Financial, Tim Crane. Thanks, Tom. Welcome, Tim. All right, we'll get after it. Uh, let's start with the, with the Fed. Uh, all over the news these days, um, the current uh, Fed uh, uh, monetary policy stance is as expected, Jason, uh, in just about a week and a half ago on uh, July 26th the, at the FOMC meeting, the Fed raised uh, the federal funds rate by 25 basis points. Now, considering the steady decline in inflation that we've seen of late and the tightening uh, credit environment, Jason, do you think it's warranted to continue to raising rates? Uh, starting off with a bank. <laughs> uh, in terms of where we sit as an economy, we have certainly seen the rate of uh, inflation declined significantly over the last year. Uh, the, the Fed has been resolutely fighting that uh, inflationary fight for the entirety of their hiking cycle. They've taken us from zero to 5%, now five and a quarter. And in that, we have certainly seen some changes in the economy, but a, a robust level of economic activity. So is it still warranted for them to, to continue to their, their rate action? Uh, in my opinion, I believe that the, the current pace of, of Fed policy has outpaced the need to fight inflation. Uh, and we are certainly at a level where the Fed could take a pause and see how things have, have developed from a policy perspective relative to, to inflation. So Jason, let's hold your thoughts on specifically what the Fed is, is going to do here. Um, but uh, we want to get the audience engaged right away. So we'll start with our first polling question. And uh, we'll pull that up here. I'll read it to you. The Fed funds target rate currently stands at, as Jason mentioned, 525 to 5.5%. And the question is, do you think the Fed will continue to raise rates this year? And we've got four answers for you. First is no, they're finished uh, raising rates. Second is yes, 25 basis points is, is probably what is the next expected uh, uh, answer. 50 basis points or 75 or more uh, before year end. So if you could take a moment and answer, those, uh, answer that question. And while we tally the results, uh, now, Jason, uh, what do you think the Fed will do? We've got three more meetings. We've got uh, September, kind of October, November, and then December. So what's your, uh, what's your best estimate? Yep. So three more meetings this year. Uh, the September meetings, the next one, we'll also have Jackson Hole in between uh, now and the September meetings, so the Fed's off-site uh, summit, if you will, or, or meeting where they get to discuss policy but not make a policy decision. Between now and the September meeting, though, the next time that they will meet, we will see a decent amount of, of economic data. And we saw an unemployment report on Friday. We'll see a couple of reports on inflation, another uh, employment report. So they'll have plenty of data to make a good decision come September. Uh, now, my own personal feelings aside that I think the Fed should have been done uh, hiking, actually one, one hike ago, I think their, their next intended course of action is going to be a pause in September. Uh, Chair Powell was pretty noncommittal in his comments after the July meeting as to whether he would hint towards a move in September or not. With the last time they took a pause in June, he was placing hints that they were going to move in July. So I would say if the Fed is going to do another 25 basis points before the end of the year, it comes at the November or December meeting, giving them a chance to look at not just one or two more data points uh, on inflation and employment markets, but uh, to see three or four before they move. So will they move in September? I would uh, hazard a guess that September is a pause, and then a, a look to, to move in November or December, provided we don't see anything surprising in terms of economic results. Yeah. So your base case is one hike probably in the second meeting? My base case is the Fed does one more hike, in the, uh, maybe in the second meeting. Maybe they pause and they're done for the year. Um, yeah. If I was sitting in that chair, I'd be voting no move. <laughs> All right. Let's see what our audience says. Uh, about two-thirds, 66%, say one more hike, 25 basis points, it says. Um, a few people, uh, right behind it would be 50 basis points. So this is pretty much uh, right on the market uh, in terms of the yield curve. So pretty consistent with your thinking. Uh, you know, Tim, the market, as I mentioned, is projecting uh, the Fed funds rate to sort of peak in November, I think, if we look at that 
uh, the yield curve. What, what are your, what's your expectation? Do you think the, the, our audience and that Jason are right that we see one more here before year end? I think so. I'm, I'm in the zero to one camp. I, I think the Fed was late to the game, but they're caught up at this point. And, um, but I think they've also been pretty clear in their communication. The market hasn't always taken it that way. So I think you get zero to one more, and I think they stay higher for longer than most people think. Got it. And, and finally, we're seeing the yield curve uh, agree with that. It took a while for them to believe it. But uh, all right, good stuff. Let's, uh, let's shift a little bit to the broader economy. Um, Jason, can you talk about your view on the health of the economy in the U.S. at the moment? So I'll put it in medical terms. I call the uh, health economy stable but guarded condition. Uh, okay. We've certainly seen some, some positive economic results. The 2.4% the increase in, in GDP for the second quarter, and at least the preliminary estimate there, uh, certainly looks on the surface to be strong economic growth. That's right on, on the average we were, we were trending at before the pandemic hit. Uh, so that misguided conception that the American economy is growing 3 3.5%. Really, for the last decade and a half, it's been two, two and a half percent. Now, at the headline basis, that looks strong. We start pulling that apart, and we see that that 2.4% was driven by a 7.7% rise in business investment. Business investment doesn't tend to be the driving factor in the American economy. It's consumer uh, consumption, personal consumption, expenditures, as the Fed calls it. That was only up 1.6%, a pretty marked deceleration from where it was in the first quarter. So if we look at those changes in consumer activity versus a one-time business influence, I would say underneath the surface, economic growth is probably a little weaker than the 2.4% we saw in the second quarter on a headline basis. And my expectations going forward would probably follow suit. Tim, what's your take on, on the U.S. economy? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, rather than guarded, I'm spotty. Um, I think if you kind of look at the two bookends, unemployment is still incredibly low and lots of pressures for you know, companies looking for labor. And on the other end, you've got corporate earnings coming down. So um, to me, it, it sort of depends where you are. And, and there's lots of people that I think are struggling through what you'd describe as a tough economy, and there's other sectors doing really, really well. Yeah, hard to put a broad brush on yeah, everybody. Yeah, I think so. Uh, well, that's fair. So let's, let's go back to the audience and pull up our second polling question of the day. Um, we've heard a lot about this term soft landing. So we're going to ask you about it. The, the Fed has, has sought to orchestrate soft landings in the past. Again, that's combating inflation with interest rate hikes and trying to bring inflation down without uh, pr triggering a recession. Um, how confident are, are you that we'll have a soft landing at the end of the Fed current rate hike cycle? And uh, we've got four different options again here. Uh, not at all confident that we'll be in a recession later this year. Uh, slightly confident, somewhat confident, or very confident that we'll be able to see a soft landing in the economy here uh, going forward. So if you could all take a moment to, uh, to respond to that one, we'll give you a minute. And in the meantime, Jason, what do you think? And we talked about the Fed a little bit earlier. Will they be able to pull this off? Well, I think in the 60 plus years of, of Fed activity that they've been attempting to engineer soft landings, you can call one resolute success, and that's, that's 94, 95. Uh, you can maybe consider 84 if that's a real hiking cycle uh, to be a success. Out of the last six, you've only seen, if we count 84 and 94, two. Uh, their last six hiking cycles ended in actual soft landings. Uh, three recessions and then one uh, abbreviated hiking cycle before the pandemic started. So if we look at those as historical evidence, the Fed doesn't have a great track record uh, at a soft landing. As Tim mentioned it earlier, Fed was a little late to the game. The general adage with the Fed is they do too much and they're too late. Uh, definitely too late in my opinion here, uh, and it seems that they've done too much. If we look at the amount uh, that they've moved interest rates from effectively zero to where they sit today, and we look at how inflation changed underneath them, uh, there's definitely a story there that inflation probably came down because of the supply chain issues we had the middle of the pandemic and all that fiscal stimulus both dissipated and disappeared. Uh, and the Fed is now fighting a much lower level of inflation with a bigger gun. Yeah, good point. Tim, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, to me, there's a couple of questions here. One is, um, does it really matter? I mean, I think there are businesses and sectors that are in a recession now. Right, and, yeah. and I think there are others that will have a tougher second half of the year. So technically, I, th I think we'll get to a recession. I think the yield curve's still very inverted. Unemployment's still, you know, an issue. So I, I think we'll get there, but I'm, I'm not sure exactly who it matters to. 
Yeah, and uh, I'm pulling up the polling question number two results here, and it looks like most folks, 54%, think that uh, we're probably not in a recession. We will not have one until sometime next year, maybe early next year. Um, but it's it's a bit mixed, uh, to your point, Tim. And uh, you know, even though the Fed's been late to the game, things are looking better than they did, you know, just about six months ago. Um, all right. Well, so. You know, let's shift to the numbers, Jason, uh, and talk specifically about GDP. Um, we saw second quarter GDP came in better than expected, 2.4% annual rate. Uh, as you look ahead, what do you project GDP growth uh, to look like over the next, say, couple of quarters? Yep, over the next few quarters, uh, and you know, the 2.4%, the I had those comments earlier that I'm not as, as confident that that's as real a number as, as it might look on the surface. Yep. But on a go-forward basis, I think everyone's looking at the conference board's um, survey results, and, and these may even seem a little rosy, even though they look flat uh, in 2024. So over the next couple of quarters here in 23, I think we'll see GDP growth start to decelerate more markedly in the fourth quarter than in the third quarter, uh, because you know, the consumer really isn't as healthy as that, that second quarter result uh, tells us it is. Uh, Tim brought up a good point that is certainly a have and have not across the economy. There are certain segments of our economy that are already in that have not camp, that are already tipping over into recession or certainly in contraction. Uh, those areas will start to show through as we get towards the end of the year and really markedly so in 2024. Uh, 2024, if we stretch out to, to let's say four quarters instead of two quarters forward, uh, those, those two out quarters, the first quarters of, of 2024, certainly look like we'll see much lower levels of GDP growth uh, simply because the tailwinds have already faded uh, and the ship is coming to a very, uh, very slow but uh, certain stop. Got it. Jason, you talked about one rate hike, but really you preface that on it just kind of depends. This, that's your base case. What, what are the things that you see as sort of the greatest threats to kind of the continued path we're seeing right now? Well, the greatest threat to the, the continued path we're, we're on right now, and that's understanding the, the American economy and the motivation for the economy, and that's really through personal consumption, through the consumer. Consumers define roughly 70% on average of American economic activity. If the consumer were to certain, suddenly stop spending, either in the event of a wider recession or uh, on a gradual basis, and I think the gradual case is what we're seeing now, um, we'd see, and we saw good evidence of what happens when the consumer stops immediately. It's the, uh, the spring of 2020. You see a massive COVID. pullback in yeah. GDP yeah. Uh, from COVID lockdowns. But I'm not projecting some sort of, of rapid stop to the economy. A gradual slowing in the economy happens and the consumer really is that, uh, that pivot point, the important piece, the risk, if you will. Uh, the other side is the employment markets. Uh, Tim mentioned the health of the employment markets already, uh, but employment markets, as healthy as they are, sort of paint this picture that it's not eminent. There's nothing that we're on the precipice of that we're going to fall off uh, in the third or fourth quarter, and that's partly through the strength in employment markets where some wage gains can fill the gap for consumers. You know, we've talked a little bit about the broader U.S. economy, so let's go a little more local here, close to home. And, and I'll define that, Tim, as more Chicago, Milwaukee, kind of the greater Midwest. What, what's your assessment of the local economy right now, and, and how is it, if it is, different than the broader U.S. economy? Yeah, I, I mean, I think pretty good. I don't think it's too different than the overall economy. We, you know, in the Midwest, we tend not to get the swings that you get both East Coast, West Coast in terms of either wages or housing. But... Um, you know, it's, it's pretty solid. And the amount of fiscal stimulus that was pumped into the system is, you know, now working its way through. And so I think it's inevitable that that slows down. The question is just kind of when. I mean, you couldn't find cars, and so we're playing catch-up on automobiles. Certainly travel um, is a catch-up. The airlines are very busy. You know, when does that slow down? I, I don't know, but I think it will. You know, you... you, you um... One of the big areas is commercial real estate has, has been a challenge um, yeah. post-pandemic for, for lots of reasons, uh, not the least of which is the you know, much higher interest rates yeah. that, that folks have to deal with. Um, what are we seeing, Tim? What are our bankers seeing here in the local real estate market from a commercial perspective? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd go back to Spotty. Um, there are areas, um, you know, central business districts that can be yeah. pretty tough right now. Um, you've got you know, 1920s or 30s skyscrapers with limited parking that um, in an environment where there are a lot of people not at work are pretty tough. And you've got other areas, you know, Fulton Market in Chicago, certain areas in Milwaukee, they're doing terrific. 
So I, I, I think the higher rates, though, Tom, you mentioned are, are going to be an issue for some uh, real estate related investments, and, and we're going to have to work our way through that. Jason, how about your take on it? You, I know you've been talking to a number of uh, bankers and, and had some uh, audiences with business owners of late. What, what are you hearing about in terms of the U.S., uh, or sorry, the local economy? From a local perspective, looking top down, yeah. uh, the, the Illinois experience in the Midwest uh, more broadly actually has had a better economic run uh, post-pandemic than the country on average. Uh, some of it is to Tim's point of, of a bit of a smoother ride. We didn't see those peaks and valleys uh, before or during the pandemic, so we've kind of come out on the other side a little bit better. I think total economic growth here in, in Illinois has been about 8.6% over those three years. Uh, the nation's about 74 so a little bit better on ag. On a specific basis, it's industry to industry. Yeah. And you talk to folks in the manufacturing sector of the economy, manufacturing rolled over into contraction uh, at a point earlier this year and it's been pretty resolutely from a survey forward-looking perspective, stuck in a contractionary environment. Uh, services have been playing catch up since the onset of the pandemic. They finally in a way caught up here in, in 2023 in terms of economic growth, and they're still clinging to uh, expansion. You're still seeing service businesses adding new clients, uh, seeing some revenue increase uh, in service businesses, and those seem to be a little healthier. And it, thanks, Jason. And Tim, you know, one more local question. Sure. Wintrust is a, you know, one of the largest residential mortgage lenders in, in Illinois. Can you comment on how, uh, I guess, the economy, but, but specifically the Fed rate hikes, um, have impacted the mortgage market? And, and what do you expect to see in the next, let's say, 12 to 18 months? Sure, there? yeah. Um, I, you know, macro, I think the, the bigger issue is inventory than rates. Mm -hmm. So obviously higher rates have reduced what, people can afford and have chased some people from the market, but there's also so many fewer homes on the market that there, there appears to be some balance there. Um, I think there's a shortage of housing, particularly at the low end that, you know, over time will get sorted out. But, um, you know, banks in general, as opposed to mortgage bankers, are a little bit better off. We can use our balance sheet. We can help people in ways that, that others can't. So, we're seeing a little bit of a pickup right now, but it's, um, it's certainly well below where it was a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. I think you hit on an interesting point there, Tim, and that's the supply side really being the driving factor in, in the housing markets right now, that it, we saw supply constraints in the pandemic with two, two and a half months average supply uh, when six right. is more normal. Yep. We're in a similar ballpark now, but it's not because People don't want to sell their homes because there's a pandemic. People don't want to sell their homes because they're going to have to buy something else. Right. And they're going to do so at more than a 2x increase yeah. in interest rates. Right. So now we have the opposite problem with, with supply. That's yeah. right. That's right. Um, all right. Thanks, uh, Tim and Jason, on that. You know, let's, let's talk. Tim mentioned banks. Let's talk about uh, the state of the banking industry. Um, and before we do that, let's pose a question to the audience. This will be our third and final polling question. Um, and we talk about this as a crisis here. Tim, you may redefine this for us, but the, uh, there's a bit of a ripple effect from the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank last spring. Uh, in conjunction with continued interest rate hikes, all of those things have led to some banks having some significant change, and specifically around lending standards. Uh, have, and the question of the audience is, have you seen other banks, in other banks' behavior, what have you seen with respect to access to credit? So have you seen no change or slightly less accommodating, somewhat less accommodating, or significantly less accommodating? Again, this is really trying to, to hone in on access to credit. So we'll give the audience a moment to uh, respond. Um, and, the, and while we tally those results, Tim, you know, I'd just like to get your thoughts on uh, what's called the banking situation, if right. you will, rather than a crisis. It started now four and a half months ago and continues to make headlines today What's your sense of the state of the, the banking industry uh, in the U.S. today? Sure, and I, and I you know, it, it was a crisis for some, um, for the great majority of banks, and I would certainly put Wintrust in that camp. It, it was really just an exercise to check whether your interest rate risk management and, and your other risk controls were in place. And, and thankfully for most of the industry, they, they were. But rapidly rising rates you know, stress banks in a number of ways. One of them, obviously, is on their securities portfolio. And so you saw banks that you know, had positioned themselves either aggressively or, or in some cases kind of weren't paying attention that really ran into trouble, and, and that sort of snowballed. 
Um, I think the great majority of banks are healthy. Uh, Wind Trust, certainly conservatively managed, is well positioned. Th these turn out to be good times for us as we get a chance to talk to our customers. And you know, every four or five years, there's one of these events that makes it important to know who your bank is and, and whether they're here to, here to help you. And, and the good news is we have been for our clients, so. Absolutely. And, and Jason, from a markets perspective, we see a bit of, of a ride on the bank yeah. stocks. Can you talk about uh, where we are now? Yeah. yeah what, the, four or five, four and a half months ago. So it's been a, it's been a run. It's been a little bit of a run. It's been a, a, a volatile run since uh, the beginning of March for, for bank stocks and just really concentrating on the regional banks as opposed to the big money center banks. You saw those banks as a basket drop by over 40% from early March until, let's call it the middle of May. I think it was actually May 11th that they bottomed. Uh, since then, they've come up some 36, 37% uh, to now sit for the year only down about 17%. So as a basket, that sort of corroborates what, what Tim had said, that you had some banks on the margin that, uh, or on the periphery rather, that really didn't pay attention or had kind of mismanaged that securities basket. For those banks that did and had good risk controls, the market's coming around to the idea uh, that these are good, solid businesses on a go-forward basis with good balance sheets and that are in good order. I think for us on the investment management side, it was an opportunity to kind of go bargain shopping, to be quite honest, in that March-April time frame uh, where we were able to pick up uh, some positions in very strong businesses uh, at significant discounts right. to where they were trading at the beginning right. of the year. Yeah, absolutely. Well, all right. Thanks, Jason. Back to our uh, polling question results. It looks like, um, you know, it's a little bit across the board, but somewhat less accommodating was 38 percent of answers. So, and so that's significant because uh, the question, again, was have you seen changes in other banks' behavior in terms of access to credit? Um, and that actually fits real well, Tim, into, into my next question, sure, which is sure. let's talk about Wintrust for a minute. You just, yeah. uh, we just re released earnings just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and then in the context of this question and the broader banking, let's call it crisis, uh, how would you characterize Wintrust's overall health? Yeah, I mean, we announced uh, earnings a little over two weeks ago, record earnings for the first half of the year, very strong in the second quarter. I think the outside world was interested in whether uh, banks could deal with higher deposit costs, which Wintrust is uniquely positioned to do. And then very interested in kind of what the credit profile looks like, particularly, as you mentioned, in some of the real estate sectors uh, a little bit earlier. And you know, we're in terrific shape. We're not seeing any systemic issues around credit right now. Um, so it, it feels pretty good. Um, we're looking forward to a strong second half of the year. We know some people have been less accommodative in terms of lending, and we're seeing new clients that um, you know, are shopping banks right now. You know, and, and Tim, you mentioned that you know some banks have struggled through this period, um, and and some analysts have said, with this interest rate environment, we talked about the commercial real estate, you know, challenges, pot potentially really heightened scrutiny from the regulators. That this might be, you know, the start of a wave of merger and and you know uh, acquisition activity, for as Jason mentioned, regional or maybe mid-sized banks. Um, are you seeing that this, or do you expect that to happen? Well, I, I certainly expect more activity. I, I don't know whether a lot will get done. And the reason I say that is, um, you know, banks with an upside down securities portfolio or banks that um, have large fixed rate loan books, um, you know, are still challenged in terms of profitability. And credit's also a little bit unknown. And so, um, you know, that's kind of three reasons that you know, you got to think about what can happen, and the, the wild card is the regulators. And so the, for mid-sized banks, regional banks, to merge um, requires approval, obviously, from our regulators, essentially the government. And, and that had been slow in coming for many banks, and there are instances of, of kind of failed merger attempts that, um, you know, caused some people to pause. And so I think the next couple to get done will be important, and I, I think there will be opportunities. They're just going to be spotty. Jason, anything to add there? Well, I would say from, from an M&A perspective, it also matters uh, valuations in the markets. I know we're going to talk about markets broadly, yeah. and I'm sure the valuation question will come up. But you know, valuations aren't very cooperative uh, in, in current yeah. markets now either. For many of those banks that are in a, a better condition that you might want to acquire, yeah. uh, you're going to be paying a pretty penny for them given where current markets yeah. sit. 
Yeah, well, and let, that's a good segue, Jason. Let's talk about the markets, uh, you know, and what, what's happening here. Uh, it's been a it really maybe surprisingly uh, a strong first part of the year. Uh, I think we finished, the S&P was up almost 21% through, um, through mid-year, through, actually through the end of July. Uh, bonds have struggled, as you would expect, in a rising rate environment, but still hanging in there in positive territory. Um, in the context of what uh, we've talked about in terms of the broader economy and, and, and the outlook that we have for interest rates, Jason, I'll start with you. What's your current view on the capital markets? I think the, the first view would be you know, some level of surprise. You wouldn't have thought that at the end of seven months into 2023, we'd be sitting here with equity markets that are 21% higher. Uh, even with the pullback over the last week, still sitting 17% higher, it doesn't make a lot of sense from where we sat in January and February thinking about uh, the capital markets. Now, it's important to note that some of that growth has been driven by a very, very narrow market. I think you throw around the term Magnificent Seven or, or the, the six stocks that kind of drove the S&P. Those seven stocks, partly fueled by a little bit of, uh, a little bit of an AI bubble that's grown uh, behind some of them, have been the outsized reason for some of those returns. Now, we saw the markets turn towards the end of May, uh, a bit of a sector rotation, if you will, to broaden up experience in markets. And we've certainly seen some names uh, and sectors start to perform better in, in June and July. As we see that broadening occur within equity markets, we're certainly seeing it come with an added element of volatility. Uh, the VIX popped up at, uh, to 17 to close last week. I think it's trending in the 16s today. Uh, during trading, but that's an elevated level from where it's been at, uh, actually back to the level of volatility we saw in, in May when things were a lot less certain from a Fed perspective. So on the equity market side, uh, somewhat surprising, but uh, robust market performance is never one to scoff at. On the bond market side, you know, bonds have done about what we'd expect them to do. And the aggregate bond market is up a little over 2%. Uh, that is okay uh, by us. I think in an average year, bonds up 4 or 5% is is a great uh, environment for bonds, and they act as that um, counterweight to equities in a portfolio uh, that they didn't do so really in 2022. So, by some measures, some folks would say the equities are overvalued right right now. Would you would you agree with that assessment? Oh, I, I definitely agree with that. Yeah. You look at a number of different valuation metrics, and across the board, they're all going to point to if right. not elevated, extremely elevated, or, or, or maximum levels of, of valuation. And we got there. We had a bit of a correction in 2022. Now we're back there from a valuation perspective. Certainly with growth stocks, uh, those Magnificent Seven look very, very expensive at this point, yeah. Yeah. Uh, particularly given the slowdown in, in second quarter results we've seen from a few of them. So valuations are very stretched in the equity market, and I would be cautious entering particularly uh, large cap growth positions at this kind of level of valuation. Makes sense. Tim, any thoughts on the capital markets, particularly cash instruments? Yeah, well, it's it's been a nice change. I mean, rates up have helped folks that live on a fixed income or yeah. less risk averse or more risk averse, I guess. Um, you know, bank CDs are, you know, 5% in some cases or above. Um, certain government instruments are in the 4 to 5% range. So if, you know, if you feel like you've had a nice run with your equities and um, you want to take a little bit off the table or rebalance a little bit, you know, the, the piece you're putting back into cash is going to do just fine. So, um, you know, maybe not a bad time. Well, you're, you're, you're queuing up, Jason. Oh, there you go. We just I had, got uh, the Great Lakes <laughs> Asset Allocation, you know, uh, or Investment Committee just reassessed asset allocation, some of it probably because of the market, strong market movement and equities. But you, you guys have made some changes, Jason. Can you share... Uh, the thinking and, and your thought process going forward? Sure. Uh, from a, a philosophical perspective, we're strong believers that diversification is really the only free lunch in investing. And, and part of that diversification means rebalancing your portfolio, rebalancing uh, in times of, of market performance when you've seen allocations drift significantly is a very intelligent thing to do. So that's what we started doing here. Uh, at, at these levels, we've seen equity markets run significantly farther than we expected. You've seen bonds trail, but still act as that ballast. Uh, we're rebalancing portfolios to put those allocations back in order. But as you mentioned, uh, some of the markets we've seen, we've adjusted capital market assumptions there, uh, particularly within the real asset space. Real assets for us is real estate, infrastructure, and commodities. Uh, that area has been a little bit more challenged from an outlook perspective than it was back in February, the last time we, we adjusted portfolio weights. So we've pulled some of the weight off the table there, particularly within commodities. Uh, China's slower recovery and the difficulties they've had in, in creating 
consumer activity uh, and no longer being as infrastructure led as that economy has been is really slowed the commodity markets from a pricing perspective going forward. And we've taken some of that weight and really started to reinvest in other segments of the equity market. Uh, but at the same time, we've swung from equities to bonds to an extent. So particularly for those balanced investors and those actually that are a little bit less risk averse. The risk averse ones we already had in effect max cash positions in uh, for those uh, risk averse investors. But for those balanced positions, we started to move some weight into uh, the fixed income space, particularly core investment grade fixed income. Uh, and in the equity space, those areas were moving that commodity and infrastructure real estate weight to uh, would be small cap U.S. stocks and emerging market stocks, areas that are riskier areas in the market, but we feel like we'll get paid more for taking the risk uh, there on the medium term going forward, while still maintaining a little safety in portfolios by increasing our bond weight. Great. And on the large cap, it sounds like you know, more value than growth. We've had quite a run on the growth side. So Yeah, we've had quite a run on the growth side. It, it's hard to argue with that run on the growth side in the short term. Uh, but for the, the longer term, we, we maintain a pretty neutral position between value and growth. Uh, core allocation is a, a little bit more um, beneficial for us to have some exposure on the growth side and then be a little bit better positioned on the value side where we likely will get some reversion to the mean. Uh, reversion to the mean meaning those growth stocks went off and ran. Value is probably going to catch up here. Uh, and we may be leaning a little bit more that way. And as you invest in fixed income, this is... Active fixed income, meaning you're getting somebody who's, who's going to be picking the, the securities rather than just buying an index, correct? Absolutely. Um, we are strong believers that uh, properly selected active management can, can win the day over the long term. And we are, in effect, pounding the table. I think I mentioned this when we last talked back in February. Uh, and we're, we're pounding the table as hard, if not harder now, for, for actively managed fixed income. There's not a table within reach, so <laughs> yeah, I can't, you can't give you the visual. Table. But uh, <laughs> if you're sitting in a passive index investment in fixed income, you're asking to get hurt. Uh, in this type of environment where an active manager can better utilize credit, uh, can better utilize security selection uh, within the portfolio to add value. And we've certainly seen active managers add significant value over passive fixed income this year already. Right. And, you know, we, we, we have a few questions from the audience, and I think it's, it's, we've got a couple of minutes to tee these up. And one of them is you've sort of touched on, but I, I thought I'd ask both of you. The best, what's the best way to take advantage of these higher interest rates? We may not, they may not be here forever, but uh, you kind of both touched on it earlier. But in summary, what's the, what's the best tactic for investors? Well, the best tactic for investors from an investment point of view, and I'll let Tim handle the banking point of view. From an investment point of view, uh, we made this uh, portfolio weighting change back in February and have, have reemphasized it here, uh, or changes in July. And that's the idea that to us, cash is always an asset class. Uh, it's always something to allocate to. It's been a difficult asset class to allocate to when you get paid nothing. <laughs> when you get paid 5% for sitting in cash, uh, it becomes a lot easier, particularly for a risk-averse investor, to have a significant weight in cash, taking a lot of risk off the table and getting paid to wait uh, for, for markets to, to rationalize. For those investors that may be sitting with money outside uh, of an investment account, uh, there are some fantastic options in the banking world to get paid while you wait. Uh, and I think Tim's kind of alluded yeah. to some of those before. I mean, again, for those folks that are interested in kind of very liquid instruments or even CDs, time liquid, obviously, um, you know, there's four or five percent opportunities all over. You know, the only thing I'd add is um, we've we've seen a big change in interest rates, you know, zero to four or five percent here. In the realm of things, that's pretty normal. And so I think I think we're starting to see people think about investing in their businesses at five percent and six percent. And, and certainly, again, it's very different than it was, you know, for the last couple of years here. But um, we're seeing clients, real estate, manufacturing, in really all sectors that, you know, think this is a good time to invest. And so, um, you know, there's people paying down their loans, but there's people, you know, looking to pursue opportunities as well. Good. Excellent. Um, we, we touched on this, too, but this was a specific question for one of our customers. How well do you think the Fed has managed inflation through its rate increases? You guys want to give uh, Chair Powell a score here? Uh, I will give him high marks for communication. I think Tim mentioned this very early in our conversation this afternoon. Uh, and I had the pleasure of being at Chair Powell's first public comments here in Chicago after he had uh, assumed the chairmanship. And he had noted in those comments that he'd learned something from the ECB uh, watching the, the prior uh, Fed chair. And, and that was to communicate to communicate clearly and to follow through in the communication. So if Chair Powell says it's higher for longer, if Chair Powell says they're looking at the rate hike, they're looking at the rate hike. 
So I'll give them high marks for communication. Well, I'll give them low marks. Uh, we were sitting here uh, in 2021, shortly after Jackson Hole uh, that year, in, in late summer 2021, expecting the Fed to, to start hiking rates. Yeah. And they had a September meeting, a November meeting, a December meeting, and they finally got to it in the March meeting of 2022. Transitory. Yeah, it, it, transitory was the, the <laughs> yeah. worst <laughs> uh, misdefinition of a dictionary word that I think a government entity has used. Yeah. Tom, I, I, I don't disagree with any of that. Again, I, I said they were late to the party, but I, I think the, the, issue, the other issue was too much fiscal stimulus too late in the cycle. I mean, th th we were spending money, you know, that we didn't need to spend. The, the pandemic was winding its way down. The economy was in reasonable shape. And, and we continue to throw a lot of money at this economy. So I, I think that'll be a challenge as we go forward. Fair enough. Uh, another question from a, from a customer is, and Tim, I'll point this your direction. Sure. How are service and product-based businesses shifting as consumer tendencies are shifting? I think there's the cyclical pieces. I mean, you're seeing it with travel as an example. You know, you're seeing it in, in some of the, the businesses that Jason mentioned earlier. So um, it's I, I just, I would say, normal cycle. I mean, we see those businesses doing well, and whether it's hospitality services, hotels doing terrific, you know, tough to get a, a reservation at a restaurant these days. So um, I was really impressed during the pandemic, really among our customer bases that reinvented their models. Mm -hmm. and, and so you're, you're seeing, you know, people or, or businesses of all sorts do things they didn't do 36 months ago. And so I, I think that's sort of interesting. I think you're seeing product changes. I think, you know, pick, pick your sector, higher education, all kinds of changes. So it's a, it's a, it'd be a longer answer. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, and just to tag on there, I, I would look at a company like Apple. Um, Apple, you know, missed from an iPhone perspective. Uh, iPhone sales were disappointing for Apple in their most recent quarter. Stock got hit by 3% day of, dropped another 2% after hours, 5% drop in one day uh, for a, a stock that was up 50% for the year. And small miss in, in iPhone sales doesn't, doesn't look like it's warranted for the drop. And even more so, you look underneath it, Apple's most profitable segment is not sales of of products, it's services. And from a services perspective, they have started to figure out this model of monetizing services. The services growth for Apple was 8% in the second quarter, 5.5% mm -hmm. in the first quarter. Uh, that seems to be for a number of businesses, even traditional manufacturing type businesses, uh, unlocking the key to services and service growth um, in the modern economy. So finding ways to deliver services uh, without necessarily standing next to someone, but still delivering standing next to someone type service. Uh, is, is a model that businesses are really starting to figure out. Yeah, agreed. Um, another question from the audience, Jason. Uh, I'll start with you on this. In your opinion, how will 2024 being an election year impact the economy? I thought we'd get to the, uh, the panel discussions in 2024 Next before time. we got this yeah, question. I, know, but, I, know. <laughs> uh, I think I've mentioned before I'm a bit of a student of history uh, in addition to the you know wearing the, the market strategist hats. and. The interesting thing to me, and I mentioned this around the last election cycle, and we have to go back to 1900 uh, in the election of William McKinley before the last time we see a president elected within two years of the start of a recession. So if we tip to recession within the next 18 months before we hit the presidential election, uh, that does not bode well for the, the current resident of the White House. Now, the other side of that is the last election cycle was full of news bites was full of moments that you could cringe and wait for the markets to open the next morning. They, oh, I can't believe they said this. Uh, thankfully, none of that came to, to fruition, but we definitely do see a little bit more about market volatility between the kickoff of primary season in March and, and the presidential election in November. I would expect we'd see that same kick up in volatility. And then there would, depending on the result of the election uh, in the fall, be obviously some volatility as the market comes to grips with uh, the dynamic of power in Washington. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you'd like to think the Fed was apolitical, and I, I think they will try to be that way, but th there's going to be a lot of pressure if there's a recession for, you know, the Fed to be moving very quickly, which I, which I, I don't think they will do, but, yeah. but I, I think there will be a lot of front, you know, front page pressure, noise. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm afraid, Jason, that we'll have more cringeworthy moments <laughs> in, the, in the year ahead, too. Um, okay, well, I'm going to give one more of this kind of a fun one. So uh, sure. uh, what's the future of the Pac-12? This is a question from oh, the I audience. Got, uh, yeah, I got, I got <laughs> Tim, this one. Tim, you got this one. <laughs> so I, 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 think, I think 
people that follow college sports uh, are, are watching the realignment of teams here. Um, you know, the, I think the Pac-12 is in trouble, and, I, and here's why I think the Pac-12 is in trouble. One, one they can't control. They're, they're on the West Coast. People watch terrific football games all day. They watch the SEC in the morning, and then they watch the Big Ten, and, and then you're getting ready to watch the NFL on Sunday. And so the, the Pac-12 games intra-conference that are on at, you know, 9 o'clock at night, other than for those on the West Coast, are a tough sell. And so I think they're struggling now to get a good media contract. They're talking about streaming with Apple. I, I, I just think that's really going to be tough. And so you're seeing this, this huge realignment in, in college sports, much of it that may not be good for the athletes, but it'll be sort of really fun for college football. <laughs> so anyway, that's my two cents. <laughs> Uh, and you, you mentioned his the SEC, but you didn't mention Notre Dame. We're also watching that on Saturday. Nope, yeah. it's okay. Well, Notre Dame's got a plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. All right, Jason. Any comments on college football? Oh, it, that uh, the college realignment decision, obviously football driven. So I, I feel a yeah. little bit for the the athletes who are not football players who have to maybe travel from. USC to Rutgers for a uh, Tuesday afternoon tennis match or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's got to be a little difficult for those student athletes. Yeah. But I said they can all afford private jets now, so they'll that's make true. a quicker flight with this <laughs> TV money. Uh, all right, no good stuff, guys. All right, well this is uh, this is going to be all the time we have for us today. I want to thank everybody for your participation with the polling questions and for joining us today. A recording of our event will be made available via LinkedIn shortly. And in the meantime, you can follow Jason Turner's Thinking on the Economy by reading his weekly market update, which you can see uh, either at the Wintrust Wealth Management uh, update or, or uh, website, rather, or through LinkedIn. Or if you just uh, want to check in with your relationship manager, they can get that information to you in a timely manner. Thank you again, everyone. Um, have a great week.